Hey everybody, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games. I'm Harry, and today we're going to be continuing my top 50 games of all time. In this video, we'll be covering my numbers 30 through 21 in particular. So let's not waste any more time, and let's get straight to it. My number 30 game of all time is La Havre Inland Port, designed by Uwe Rosenberg and published by Z-Man Games. This is a two-player version of a bigger game simply known as Le Havre, also designed by Uwe Rosenberg. This game is confined to a two-player um, experience as opposed to Le Havre, which can go all the way up to five players, I believe. Uh, so in Le Havre, basically, you are running a port and you are using different resources, startup resources, uh, wood and brick and different kinds of food to create further resources and produce money ultimately and whoever has the most money wins the game well what this game does is it you know adds a unique mechanism you have a dial that not only keeps track of each of the rounds you have a certain amount of rounds in this game i believe it's 14 or so or 12 i think it's 12 not only does the dial keep track of the round you're in but also with each dial it changes how many times you can execute a certain action so if you wait longer you might be able to execute an action of one of the buildings you're acquiring and building buildings throughout the game it, you can execute the action of the building multiple times if you wait more rounds however if you wait too many rounds then you lose um, the rights or you lose ownership of those buildings altogether so it's it's just trying to keep that balance of trying to maximize get the most juice out of out of your buildings but at the same time not um taking for granted they're going to be there for you always and of course your opponents can pay you to use your buildings as well and whoever has the most money at the end of the game uh is the winner it has a very nice what what we like to call engine building uh it, you know system there you 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 start something and it's a slow burn at first but it begins to rev up and all of a sudden you're producing and producing lots of resources lots of food and lots of um lots of money um so it has that economic feel to it if you like number crunching and that sort of thing this could be a game for you that's my number 30 of all time, Le Havre and Limport. Now we move on to my number 29 game of all time, represented by just these two little decks here. This is Magic the Gathering, and this in particular is a dual deck that I purchased called Elves vs. Inventors. Um, this is a tactical two-player game. It's a legend within the industry. Um, it's been around for over 25 years, and lots of people who don't necessarily consider themselves gamers or hobbyists are very big fans and, and highly into uh, Magic the Gathering, especially uh, for the collectible aspect. This is a collectible game. You can buy boosters and you don't necessarily know what you're going to have, what's going to be inside, and you have rares and commons and all that sort of thing. But when you get a dual deck, you have a you know predetermined set that you know exactly what you're getting. And it's a little bit easier for those who like to play or would like to play Magic the Gathering on a casual basis. So again, as I was saying, this is designed by Richard Garfield. Um, and it's a tactical two-player game where you're using uh, different um, creatures and different, um, and, and, and different um, magical powers to combat against each other. And you're fighting against each other and you're trying to defeat the other person's um, player you're actually trying to defeat the player but the creatures uh, that are in the way kind of serve as buffers between the players so you kind of have to go through the creature before you can go to the player and, and knock down the player's health and uh, it plays really quick but it's it's really tactical it's 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 fun to just manipulate your hand and try to manipulate your deck as efficiently as possible um Again, I, I'm not into it in, in the way that lots of people are into Magic the Gathering, but I, I respect it for what it is, and um, and I've had lots of fun playing it with uh, the people that I've played it with so far. It's a two-player game. Sometimes a two-player only game. It's limited for me because while I do probably do most of my gaming two-player, 
I do like to have the option of throwing in uh, additional players in a game. So, and, and a two-player game doesn't give me that. I think there is a way of playing this with multiple people, but I haven't looked into that. So that is my number 29 game of all time, Magic the Gathering. Now I will move on to my number 28 game of all time, and that is Taj Mahal. And this is designed by legendary designer Reiner Knizia and published or republished by Z-Man Games. This is a rebranded re, uh, um, second edition of sorts, a reprint of Taj Mahal. And Z-Man knocked it out of the, out of the park with its uh, art and graphic design. I think the game looks nice. Taj Mahal, it's kind of like an auction game, kind of like Reiner Knizia's thing. Um, I mean, people probably wouldn't consider it auction at, at first glance, but it is an auction. It's just a different type of auction. You're not bidding with currency or with money, but instead you have a, a, a hand of cards and they come in different colors. And I guess the different colors are like different suits or maybe different denominations, if you will. And each of those cards has one or two symbols on it. And the symbols represent different spheres of influence within India that you're trying to um, have the majority within. And when you're placing cards, you, you place a card down at the beginning of the round and you need to follow subsequently in subsequent turns, you need to follow that color that you played that first turn. So if you commit it to blue for the rest of that round, you're going to be adding more blue cards. But at the moment that you decide to drop out of the auction, if you have the most in some of those symbols, in some of those spheres of influence, then you win the bid for those spheres of influence, which I find to be an incredible idea. Sometimes the, the, the tough decisions in a, in a um, auction bidding game is that when you're going to pass, you've lost, you've lost your opportunity to win anything. Here, you're gonna, you could very well win tons of stuff if at that moment you, you know it's best to drop out and you and you know that it's not worth staying in the bid for one or two other things you might gain when you might risk the one or two things that you've already earned again it's a great game it, it has a route connection building aspect to it which i always enjoy in games it has lots of resource collections which exponentially these resources get you more and more points as you accrue more of them throughout the game it, it just has a lot of things. Again, I might be hyping this game up, but I think it's severely underrated. It's a game that's not really talked about, even within uh, the conversation of, of Reiner Knizia games. I feel like it's a little bit underrated, but it is a fun game, beautiful game, um, Indian themed. Again, Reiner Knizia games are pretty abstracted, so you're not going to get a deep feel for that Indian theme. But if but you get the nice look at the Indian map and, and some other aspects of Indian culture. It's a, it's a fun game. I've had fun playing it multiplayers. Um, it has a pretty um, functional two-player variant that I've also enjoyed playing. And that's my number 28 game of all time, Taj Mahal. Now we move on to my number 27 game of all time. And that is Sheriff of Nottingham. And this game is designed by Sergio Halaban and Andre Zatz. And published by Arcane Wonders and Simon or Come On Games. This game is a bluffing game where the, the heart of the game or the, the skeleton of the game is just a simple set collection. You are trying to get sets of different types of goods. And the different goods include bread and cheese and chicken and apples. But... There are also contraband or illegal goods. And you're trying to sneak these illegal goods along with your legal goods. And you're trying to get past the Sheriff of Nottingham. And every round, a different player takes turn, takes a turn being the Sheriff of Nottingham. And trying to figure out who's bluffing, who's straight up lying, who's counter bluffing. And so on and so forth. And you can you can um, bribe the sheriff. You can um, false bribe the sheriff. Well, you can't lie to him, but you can pretend to to be uh, to be lying by bribing and then actually be telling the truth. Because if the sheriff calls your bluff and you're actually telling the truth, well, then the sheriff pays you a penalty. If you're lying, then you pay the sheriff a penalty, right? 
But at the end of the game, if you have the majorities in these different sets, you score bonuses, you score points for all your individual cards. Each card has a certain amount of gold value, and that's how many points you will score. And whoever has the most gold wins the game. So money is it's it's not only your end game score, but it's also a powerful resource throughout the game to give you leverage to maybe uh, bribe sheriffs throughout the rounds. Um, and also to just make you feel comfortable if you are the sheriff willing to call someone else's bluff out, willing to open someone's envelope that has their cards inside and take the risk of losing money because you feel like, hey, I have a good en en enough money. I, I feel like I have some wiggle room. I'm okay losing a little bit. So this game is a very interesting game. There's a lot of different ways you could go about it. You can be honest. You could be dishonest. You could be a little bit in between. You can vary it up, switch it up. Uh, you definitely have to have a good poker face. You have to you have to be uh, quick to forgive and not take things personal and, and not take things outside of the game, outside of the realm of the game. What happens in the game stays in the game. But it creates fun moments, funny moments, um, some moments where, you know, you just everybody's just surprised at what happened. And uh, and one person might be upset. Um, it's been a great game. It's a great group game. Played a lot with my nephews, my niece, my wife. And we've always enjoyed it. And that is my number 27 game of all time, Sheriff of Nottingham. Now we move on to my number 26 game of all time. And this is a little bit heavy. And it's just one of the boxes in which I keep my Ticket to Ride collection. Ticket to Ride. Designed by Alan Moon and published by Days of Wonder. This is a former Spiel des Jahres winner. That's the most prestigious gaming award in the gaming hobby based out in Essen, Germany. This game is an evergreen. It's a classic. Came out back in 2004, so it is over 15 years old. Doesn't sound like much, but in the gaming industry, people tend to cycle through things very quickly and move on to the newer and fresher stuff. However, this game continues to hang in. And for me personally, number 26, it's still a really good game. It's a gateway game. It's a great game to teach people who um, don't necessarily play lots of games. It's a great game to teach people who might like geography. So basically, for those who don't know Ticket to Ride, you just have a map. And in the base game, the map is North America. As a matter of fact, I have all my maps or most of my maps here in this one box. And I have Africa and I have Asia and I have the Nordic countries and I have Europe and I have North America and the base game comes with North America and mostly North mostly United States but a few parts of Canada and basically you are collecting sets of of colored card uh, of colored train cards that you will use to build different routes on the on the board connecting cities to cities you start the game with a few objectives, some destination tickets, which give you long-term goals for the game where you want to connect a route, of a series of routes from one city to another city, and you'll get X amount of bonus points for accomplishing that, but you'll also risk losing that many points if you fail to connect those two cities. Um through a series of connections or routes. It is a fun game with very simple mechanisms, but it gives you that crunchy feel of long-term planning and strategy. It could be very cutthroat if you play with four or five players. I think four players is actually more cutthroat than, than five. Well, actually, no, no, five is definitely more cutthroat because four is the first player count where it allows some double routes. There's some double routes in the board that aren't even accessible in a three or two player game, but become accessible in a four player game. But yeah, the point is there's so many people, um, you know, crowding the board and, and trying to accomplish perhaps different routes, but that there's so, some overlap and you end up blocking someone and cutting someone off from their objective altogether. It comes with tons of different map expansions. If you're a world traveler or appreciate ge geography in any way, this is the game for you. You get to see all these different beautiful uh, map boards of different parts of the world. And the best part of it all is that each expansion is not just a little map there for you to explore a different geography. Um, it's also each expansion adds a, a new little twist or a little nuance that just adds enough to make the game feel a little bit different from another map expansion. Um, this game has been a family favorite. I feel like 
We are a Ticket to Ride family. I have a few games that I feel like we are just a, you know, fill in the blank family because we play these games so often and we enjoy them so much. And, you know, even though sometimes they kind of like start getting down on the list, you know, if I would have made this list a couple of years ago or, or even a year ago, Ticket to Ride would have been higher than 26. But at the same time, you, we just don't envision ever losing our joy for these games altogether. And that's my number 26 game of all time, Ticket to Ride. Now we move on to my number 25 game of all time, and that is Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small. And this is designed by Uwe Rosenberg and published by Lookout Games. This is, this is actually the big box edition, so it includes two expansions with it. This is the equivalent of what La Havre Inland Port was to La Havre. Agricola, all creatures big and small, is to Agricola. It's a condensed, confined, two-player version of Agricola. What is Agricola? Agricola is your quintessential farming game. You are a farmer and you are trying to build up a farm. However, this cuts out lots of the meatier, more complex, and sometimes more complicated um, aspects of the regular two, uh, the regular Agricola, which could also be played with two players, but goes all the way up to four and even up to six with some expansions. This game cuts out lots of the other stuff. You're not, you're not farming vegetables. You're not building a family. You're not worried about feeding your family. All you're doing is animal husbandry. All you're doing is raising your 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 herds, raising your flocks. You know of sheep, of cattle of pig, of horses, and trying to get buildings along the way that help you maximize, uh, you know, your, your breeding of these animals to the most efficient way possible. Again, this is a fun game. It's a short game. It's a worker placement game, which means each turn you have a certain amount of workers, represented by meeples in this game, which you place on a spot in the board. And when you place that on a spot of the board, that spot triggers a certain action, a certain benefit for you that your opponent on that same round cannot trigger because you have blocked that space. You have occupied it. Um, again, it just makes, even though you don't, there's no direct involvement or interaction in these kind of games, the fact that you can block an opponent and try to anticipate where they're going to go because they might cut you off or block something, not even because they have anything against you, but because they're just as interested in a certain spot as you are, but you want to get to there first. And it's all about timing and knowing when and when and where to do things. It's a it's a fun game. Um, it's a great two-player experience. For the most part, I play it a lot with my wife. And we have had lots of enjoyable games of my number 25 game of all time, Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small. And now we move on to my number 24 game of all time, which is Dice Town, designed by Bruno Cathala and Ludovic Mablanc. This is the first edition by Madigo Games. I believe there was a reprint also by Madigo. I might be mistaken if it was Madigo, but definitely I know that there's a reprint, you know, nicer looking edition. This is the first edition of Dice Town. This is a Wild West themed dice game. As the name says, all you're doing each turn is taking this cup, this bullet shaped cup, putting five poker dice in it, each side of the dice, each of the six sides of the dice represent a different uh, suit of the poker cards, uh, a different suit and rank. So you can have a king and a queen and a jack and a 10 and a nine. And you have this town represented on this board that gives you different benefits if you are the majority in any of those respective suits. So if you were the first, you were the player who rolled the most, you know, tens, you benefit by going to the bank and robbing the money. If you had the most kings, you go to the sheriff's office and now you're the new sheriff in town. If you are, you had the best poker hand. So if you like poker and know a little bit about poker, it could be helpful. You have the best poker hand out of all the players. You go to the mayor's office and you just acquire some property. And all of this is with the goal and the purpose of having the most points at the end of the game. Now, just recently, we've started playing with 
one of the expansions, the Wild West expansion, which basically just adds a second option to each of those different places, which is great. It gives you more options for if you don't want to choose option number one when you win. Let's say you had the most jacks, then you could choose option number two if it's more optimal for you on that specific turn. It does elongate the game. It makes it a little bit of a, a longer experience. But if you like the Wild West theme, if you like just rolling dice, and each turn, picking which dice you're going to keep and kind of trying to outsmart and outguess um, your opponents. Very similar to the, the feel in poker where you're trying to determine how many cards you want to keep or how many cards you don't want to keep. Um, and at the same time, try to outthink and outsmart your opponents. It kind of gives that same feel with a nice little Wild West flavor. And that is my number 24 game of all time, Dice Town. Now we move on to my number 23 game of all time, and that is Descent. And this is designed by Corey Kanieska, and it says here, also with Daniel Clark and Adam Sa Sadler, it was inspired by the first edition of Descent. This is the second edition. The first edition was designed by Kevin Wilson, and this is published by Fantasy Flight Games. Descent is a fantasy themed dungeon crawler where a group of heroes band together to defeat monsters and defeat the evil overlord and one player plays the overlord. Now there is an app which lets you play this game fully cooperatively and the app takes care of all the overlord, um, all the overlord business, all the bookkeeping and so on and so forth. Now, this is a campaign-driven game, so you can have campaigns where you embark on different quests, and according to what you do in those quests, the heroes level up, the overlord levels up, this triggers a different quest depending on who wins. You go to this quest or you go to that quest, and ultimately, after a, a certain number of quests have been played, whoever wins that finale, that last quest, is the overall winner of the entire campaign. I've been playing this campaign mode with my friend Andrew. I've been playing this campaign mode, another campaign, a separate campaign going on with my nephews and niece, and we're just having a good time. I always like to be the overlord. I don't know why. I don't know what that says about me, but it's just fun trying to figure out the different puzzle of each quest. That's really what it is. Every quest is different from the previous one. It might share in the overall mechanisms and, 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 and things like that. But the objective of each quest is radically different. And the objective of each quest makes a certain approach or method invalid as opposed to it being an optimal method in another quest. And also... It just keeps you on your toes. You don't get you don't get into a comfort zone trying to repeat the same amount of things. Now this game does have lots of luck because you are chucking dice, so you're rolling dice to determine a uh, combat m m primarily. And of course, there's a a bunch of different skill tests that also require you rolling the dice. And sometimes you roll duds. You just don't roll what you want to roll. And sometimes the opponents roll the perfect roll to your detriment. And you're just frustrated because they were that lucky and not you. If you don't like luck at all, if you want deterministic combat, this is not the game for you. But if you like variety, this game comes with tons of heroes, tons of different monsters, tons of different quests. There are so many expansions for this game. You could never possibly exhaust them all. You could never get, get bored if, if you're quick to get bored because of repetitive content. That's not going to be a problem at all with this game. And that is my number 23 game of all time, Descent. Now we move on to my number 22 game of all time. And that is Dice Hospital. Dice Hospital is designed, I'm going to try my best to pronounce this name, by Stanislav Kordonsky and Mike Nudd. And it is published by Alley Cat Games. Dice Hospital it's um, relatively recent to my gaming repertoire, re relatively decent to, recent to my um, collection. It's a worker placement game, essentially, where each player has their own 
board. So there isn't that tension of can, you know, my opponent occupy the space that I want to go to. And your board represents your own hospital. You're each running your own hospital. And the patients themselves are dice. So you're rolling these dice at the beginning of the game and each of the dice are different colors, green, yellow, and red, I guess representing different types of diagnoses. I don't know what, what it really represents. It's very abstracted. It's very puzzle-like, not very thematic at all. But as you roll these dice, they have different numbers ranging from one through six, but one through six can never be admitted. It has to be somewhere between the two to five range. So the higher you are, the closer you are to being healed and to being discharged. The lower you are, the closer you are to flatlining and dying. So, you know, if your patients ever get all the way to, down, to number one due to your neglect of treating these patients, then they die and that costs you points. But if you can treat these patients successfully and raise them all the way up to a six and then eventually a seven, they discharge. And when you discharge patients, you gain points. And if you discharge cluster of patients, uh, uh, multiple patients in, in a single round, then you score exponentially. So you don't just want to discharge every round. You want to discharge several dice every round so that you can maximize the amount of points you have. And each round, the tough decision that you're making is the um, acquiring of different improvements, different upgrades. You're either upgrading your staff by getting different specialists who help you with the particular colors in the game in different ways, or you're upgrading your facilities by getting different um, hospital units that, again, affect certain colors positively. And again, you're just drafting these, and there is a player order to things, so one player can um, technically indirectly hurt you by getting an improvement that you would have liked to have, that you felt that your hospital was really lacking. Um, it's great for just you know figuring out how to maximize this puzzle. It has a pretty good solo variant that I've played a few times, and I've had lots of fun. Again, if you can appreciate the puzzly nature of a game if you're okay with a very abstracted type of theme and if you have any affinity to the healthcare industry or to hospital nursing you know medicine at all i think that this game can you know be a fun and enjoyable experience for you and that's my number 22 game of all time dice hospital and now for the final uh, game of this particular video, my number 21 game of all time, and that would be Coliseum. And this is designed by Wolfgang Kramer and Marcus Lupke. I think I'm saying that right. And this is published by Tasty Minstrel Games. And again, this is a second edition of sorts, a reprint. The original was designed, uh, was published by Days of Wonder Games. And lots of the people who own that game or own that game feel that from a graphic design and component perspective that it was a better uh, edition. This, however, is a really good edition too. Um, the box art might not do it for you, but I do think that the components in the game are very fancy. It's pretty heavy because you've got some really nice metal coins in this game. Now let me talk to you about the actual gameplay. So this picture would make you think that this is about the gladiator fights within uh, the Colosseum. But really what this is, is each player is in charge of their own Colosseum and running the programs and the events that go, go on in the Colosseum. It's almost like running your own theater. And throughout the game, you are trying to recruit and acquire all the necessary resources that you need to put on your performances. You're trying to uh, you know, recruit your actors, your comedians, your warriors. You're trying to recruit uh, and acquire your, your scenery and, and, and your horses and your chariots and different things that collectively help you produce a, sp a, a particular event or performance. You are drafting these performances. You're actually buying these, these events. And each of them have a certain amount of required um, resources to put them to put them on. And you're each round you're have you're participating in an auction. I like auction bidding games, as you could tell. And the auctioning is very interesting because every player 
gets the opportunity to, to, you know, put something up for auction. And until that player has won their own auction, they basically keep on having more, more and more auctions. So other players get to benefit off that as well. Now, however, no player can win two auctions within one person's opportunity to put up something for auction. So if, if it's my turn and player A just finished winning um, a, a set of tokens that I put up for auction, and now I get to put up another set of tokens for auction, player A cannot participate in this auction until I finally win it. Then the player after me in clockwise order gets to put up a set of tokens and all of a sudden player A as well as myself, we are you know participants, valid participants of that auction again. So it's really cool. It creates the opportunity for many auctions to be had in every round. Doesn't necessarily always work out that way. Of course, there's limited you know, money, of course. And also just sometimes people really, really want a specific thing and they, they fight tooth and nail until they, until they finally get it. What's interesting about this game is that your final score is according to your best performance that you put on in the game. There are five rounds, five performances that you're putting on and your best score will be your final score. It's not cumulative at all. However, what's interesting is your best score might not be your fifth and final performance. More likely than not, it will be your fifth, if not your fourth, but it's possible that maybe even your third performance, if it was just that good and other people just couldn't live up to it, it's possible that your third performance might just be good enough to be to win the game or at least good enough to be your final score. Um, it's a fun game. It, it just creates that, that feeling of running a show, that feeling of managing your resources wisely, some really cutthroat um, auction bidding that's alleviated to some extent by a trading phase that also goes on in the game, right? How many auction bidding games would be um, easier to tolerate if we knew that after we failed to get what we wanted, there was still another way of getting it through trade. And that's exactly what this game provides. Um, again, great components, um, great, great immersive feel as you're playing the game and running the show. So many different ways to optimize your strategy and to, and to score and to and to get lots of points and even when you're on the losing end of this game the experience is so enjoyable that you're not even complaining and that's my 30 number 31 game of all time coliseum so that those are my top uh 10 games my 30 to 21 for this week as i continue to do my top 50 games of all time join me next week i believe when i will do my numbers 20 through 11 as I continue and almost get down to the top 10 in this ranking. Thank you so much for coming here and watching. Thank you so much for just investing or taking a, taking aside a little bit of your time to join me in this countdown and to watch this video. Please give this video a like. Please subscribe to this channel if you're interested in following our content. And until next time, this is Harry from When Harry Met Board Games. See you around. Bye-bye. <laughs>